Hi, uh, I'm Katie Segal. Hi. <laughs> I'm Kurt Sutter. I'm, I'm more excited than he is, maybe. I, at least I sound more. Because this is the first episode of our new podcast called Pi. And we wanted to welcome you all into our home. Beautiful home. Because this is where we're doing it from. Uh, we are in what we call the Red Room. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. And um, we're super thrilled to be here. And Pi, uh, people, influences, and experience. This is his. Uh, uh, is our uh, something we wanted to do for a minute and looking for our way in and we think uh, uh, we think we found it. Yeah, we do. And we're really looking forward to doing it. We're super excited to bring our first guest on, but we just have a little bit of a disclaimer because uh, this this very first episode, I'm not in the house. Um, Kurt's at home with our guest and I am in Mexico City shooting a movie. so, I'm on Zoom from my lovely hotel room. And it's it's a little odd for me. Oh, it was odd? Yeah, because I love you so much. And I, you know, I love Why to be able to reach. Why you that so facetiously? It was a tone. Give me again. One more time. <clears throat> I love you so much that I like to reach out and touch you. <laughs> he actually does mean that. He's just, you know, a little shy sometimes. So you are, uh, you're not here in person. No. But uh, we were very excited about our first guest. Oh, yeah. I'm so glad that we got him and we had uh, such a good conversation. And and, uh, and he, here's the whole thing with, uh, and you'll hear me say this a thousand times, we like to do no research whatsoever. So we know nothing other than perhaps the professional persona of the individual showing up. Uh, and Dax Shepard, our first guest uh, was uh, uh, was the beginning of that legacy of not knowing anything. Well, I'm just going to say mm -hmm. I've listened to Dax's podcast, so I actually was cheating. Oh, so you know, I, you I know knew a little bit about story. it. I got yeah, you. because Dax does a great podcast where he is very open about his experiences mm. in his life. So I was cheating. You were cheating, bit. but um, but in general, you're right. Yes, no, no research. So let's let's do it. Dax! <laughs> here's here's how this started. Yeah, please. Um, I have no friends. Okay. And we would we were like, we'd see people and we'd be like, oh, uh, for instance, you and Chris, we'd be like, oh, they'd be fun to hang out with. Oh, and so flattering. So, or we, you know, like she, she was on the plane with you and McGregor coming back from wherever. And I was like, oh. Tell you and McGregor we should hang out, and and she goes, my husband thinks we should hang out, and he's like, oh, all, all right. <laughs> but but so this for us was how do we get to know people really quickly, like uh, kind of an intimate little dinner party where um all we serve is dessert. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and it really has nothing to do with the person we know as celebrity actor director whatever it's really about um mythology a mythology bit of, like the 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 nature and nurture of who manifest of what manifested the dax that we know from television movies and that kind of stuff yes so it's it's not you know hollywood chat wouldn't you say that's sort of the idea yeah i would say you know we um I mean, we certainly have space for anybody that wants to talk about something that's presently going on or, you know, whatever, but, and it, it doesn't have to, it, it can go where it goes, but we're more curious about uh, what it was like, what happened and what it's like now. Uh -huh. That's what that we're more familiar. curious about yeah. um, in terms of. And Katie, have you told Kurt that we have, you and I have met? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, and that. Um, that, and he knows the context we've met. He knows all that. So yeah, uh -huh. absolutely. So I'm obviously, as you guys would know, I'm completely open about that. Yeah, as oh, are we. Recovery yeah. as are we. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, as yeah, are yeah. We. In fact, tomorrow. Tomorrow, I know. Thirty-one years. Mm -mm. Uh huh. Oh my God, dude! Thirty-one years. That's not possible. I know it's impossible. It's right? Impossible. I know. I wasn't, even born. I wasn't even born yet. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez, I'm 37 what? years. Crazy. 37. So insane. Oh, my Lord. I, was, I know. I was just talking to another fellow of ours that's also in the public eye. And we were 
you know, we're like old timers now, which is crazy, man. So crazy. Yeah. Yeah. You think of those people who you regarded as old timers. It's hard to reconcile, right? Absolutely hard to reconcile. You have this as an actor too. Like I, I have been on shows with people. Well, it's happened to me. It's like all of a sudden I'm like in kind of teen comedies, and then all of a sudden I have kids on a show. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I guess <laughs> I guess I could have kids at right. this point. Right. And it goes all the way up. And I, you know, I was on the show with Craig T. Nelson, and the notion that they tell him you're going to die in this scene, and not because you get hit by a car, but because you're that's, older yeah. and your heart, like. It weirdly forces you to r- reconcile how, how old you are because you we don't I don't feel my right. age, but it's odd that the business <laughs> sort of flags that for you. You're like, uh, oh, I I guess I am old enough to be a father. <laughs> yeah, or this wonderful actor I was working with, she had to start playing someone with Alzheimer's, and she's like, yeah, it's so fucking weird right. that that makes sense to the audience. Oh, <laughs> I used to ask my dad all the time. My dad was. My dad died early, he died in his 50s. But I remember talking to him and asking him like, well, what does this feel like to be 55? How does that feel? And he would say to me, I don't feel any different. I feel the same as I felt when I was 25. I feel, and I, and I always thought, wow, that's so weird. How can you look like that? And you feel like, you know, but now completely get it. I still get it. Yeah. You're almost waiting for that moment where you go, oh, right. I feel old. Uh, but it certainly hasn't happened to me. And most people I know that are much older than me. It hasn't happened to them either. Yeah. Like I have a single, I have a single friend who's 74 and he has told me, yeah, I can feel the faculties diminishing a bit. I can feel I shouldn't ride my motorcycle on a dirt road. I should, you know, right, like in right. uh, watching him do that with a lot of grace has been kind of coolly, you know, informative of, it's Maybe. it's humbling though too because I've had some back stuff and can't train the way I used to train and you just have to go, okay, that's my training now. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I mean, some of it is just, I mean, that can happen to anyone or an any athlete along any period of 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 their career, but when it's when you know it's like, yeah, things just don't sort of you know, yeah, come together the way they used to, and you, it's it's you know. It's, it is humbling. Yeah, just being honest about the fact that, like, mm, probably not going to get faster. Right. <laughs> like, any <laughs> fantasies I had of improvement yeah. were now shifting yeah. to, like, sustainment is the win. Exactly, exactly. It's so weird, yeah. yeah. Well, if they do say that you should try to learn new things as you get older. You know, like, uh, I'm always, I, I play piano, but I'm self-taught, so I'm always trying to take piano lessons, and I never fucking do it. I'm like, no. I, I just, I cannot learn that new thing, how to do yeah. it your way or a language. You know, I would love to learn another language. And they say that that is good for, you know, why are we talking about getting older? I have freed myself. I have liberated myself from some of those, I should learn a language things. <laughs> that that uh, being one of them. Right, right. Or yeah, I was like, I should know how to play the piano before I die. Some of these things I am finally going like, no, you didn't play piano. You're yeah, not going to yeah. speak French. Uh, right. You do a bunch of other shit. Uh, stop beating yourself up over yeah, this. Yeah. You've done just fine. I think the thing I want to learn is, yeah, to stop kicking my ass because I don't know French. That's, um, a, that's a really, really good yeah. point. Yes. <laughs> I, I sort of think of it more in terms of keeping your brain alive. And then I sort of think, yeah, but we're actors. I still have the capacity to learn lines very easily. Yeah. So that in itself is good for your brain, you know? Yes, you're and you're in Mexico City. That's novel. You're you know, you're taking you're slowing time down. There's tricks. Yeah. That's yeah. the po- the podcast for me, I have a fantasy that it'll be the thing that keeps me really, really sharp because Mondays is actors or celebrities, musicians, whatever. But Thursdays is experts. Like last Thursday was Bill Gates. I have to sit with him and understand <gasps> what he's saying. And then I have a physicist on and then I have you know this guy who runs the the Broad Institute at MIT so I wow. every Thursday is an expert that I have to like really brush up on it uh at least be able to convert what they're saying into layman enough so people can listen so that weirdly I think is 
taking care of itself. Like I'm just really forced to be learning I, nonstop. And that's the coolest part of the job. That's, far. Oh, that's I love perfect. that. Let's that's, feel that. Let's do that. A, well, I was going to say that that is a perfect segue into what we do here, which is um, absolutely no research. Yeah, 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 yeah. But <laughs> there's know, value to that. Yeah. Well, we just, because it's, we, we know, you know, we know you as, but we don't know you. As Kristen's husband, yeah. yeah Most yeah, people yeah. do. <laughs> Not true. Um, um, by the way, gave her, she got one of her first jobs was- Were you on, on Deadwood? W- no, it was on a script that I wrote on The Shield. The Shield, okay. Yep. Yeah, her first couple were like Shield yep, and Deadwood. Yep. So you were writing on The Shield when that happened? Yep, and I wrote the episode in which she- Oh, really? I, yeah, I think she did. And something bad happens. My she, her first few roles, she generally got raped or murdered. That was pretty much yeah. that, that was one of my face. The people <laughs> yeah, just yeah, wanted yeah. to torture. Yeah, and it was Danny Pino who did it. Uh huh. Yeah. So there's <laughs> a little backstory there. But tell us where, um, like, where did you go? Where did you grow up? S- siblings, the parents. Yeah. Um, I know they were parents. Probably were involved. Yeah, yeah. Well, some. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm from a Detroit suburb. Um, super blue collar. Most people work in the automotive industry on the line. Um, single mother. My parents got divorced when I was three. I have a brother that's five years older than me. I have a little sister that's six years younger than me. I had three stepdads before I graduated high school. Um, alcoholism is everywhere. My dad got sober when I was 14 which is great. Your biological dad? My biological father. Right. Yeah, he got sober when I was 15. Um, my mother will be the first to tell you she's never met an addict. She didn't marry. So that's kind of the, <laughs> that's why she loves me <laughs> so much. A girl like me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it sounds familiar. <laughs> if someone was like named Dave and they were in the in the middle of a blackout, it was straight to the chapel. <laughs> <laughs> ah, <laughs> wow. Uh, Love man. that. So yeah, um, a, a pretty chaotic childhood. We moved a lot. There were a lot of dudes uh, coming through who had agendas. I have a, you know, to really condense everything, a huge authority complex, um, <laughs> some chips on my shoulders. But I do think I've, I've kind of, I like to think I'm post a lot of that stuff. But um, I was dyslexic. I didn't learn to read till fifth grade. I went wow. to the learning disabled room every day. I have a huge chip on my shoulder about being stupid. Uh, but then Aww. I did kind of good. Then I got out of school and I just got hammered and lived in my car and was on a road trip for two years. And I was in Detroit. This is after high school? Yeah, after high school. And I was just, I had it all figured out. Well, four of us lived in a loft in downtown Detroit, 3,000 square foot loft for 400 bucks a month. So we all had to make $100 a month. So we all worked. Four roommates. Yeah. Yeah. So we worked like a week a month and we went to punk rock shows and we got hammered and did drugs and it was absolutely heaven. (laughs) And one morning I was just looking around this apartment. I was like, Ugh, if I don't get up and leave here right now, I'm going to be in this apartment in right. 10 years. Like right. I could sense it. So I moved to California. I had been a class clown and I thought I was funny and I thought I will come here and do stand up and I'm going to give that a shot. And then I got here and I was way too afraid to do stand up. And I discovered this theater, the Groundlings, where... You could do comedy, but you were with other people. And if you ate shit, you ate shit together. And then so I auditioned for that and I just completely fell in love with it. I loved doing improv. I loved writing sketches. This episode is being brought to you by BetterHelp. For someone who's been in therapy for many years, it has helped me to grow, learn, understand my patterns, get me through some rough times. And um, I'm forever grateful that I I have learned how to ask for help. I uh, concur. In fact, we were just discussing my uh, potential need to get back into therapy. And if you're thinking about starting therapy, we recommend giving BetterHelp a try. It's completely online and they will match you with a therapist, which is super important. You want to find the right person to spill the beans to. And you can also switch therapists at any time at no additional charge. BetterHelp is designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash pie today to get 10% off your first month. 
That's better help. H E L P dot com slash pi P I E. Do wait, wait, wait. I'm going to, I'm going to interrupt you. Yeah. Because you're moving so quickly. I'm and sorry. we have one question. I, I, I have a question about beyond earlier. Yeah. Are were you close with your mom? Was that like, uh, were you like, um, the older, uh, cause you're the oldest of three. Is that what you said? Middle, middle, middle. You're middle. So, so were you, uh, mom's keeper or were you mom's buddy? What yes. or were you, which were you? I was the golden child. Um, ah. There was a baby and a teenager and a lot of chaos. And I was the one who never asked her for anything that was kind of responsible. I wanted to be the least amount of burden on a very full plate for her. And she adores me. I mean, whatever uh -huh. confidence I have, she thought I was going to, you know, maybe levitate one day. I mean, she really, really... Uh, she is arriving today. Um, we're we were so so close. We are so so close. Um, That's great. Yeah, I mean, I've gotten older, and it's more complicated because I had a very clear story, which was she was the hero and my dad was the villain. Mm. Right. And for leaving, for leaving, for having fun, for having a nice house, right. for us being in a shithole, you know, a, a ton of stuff. Um, he died when he was 62 in 2012 and we had a fine relationship. It, it was challenging at times, but he's been dead for a while and other things have materialized and I've had children. I can tell you the most profound moment. I had these two little girls and I was like, I took my then three-year-old on a trip to North Carolina to show her like the Blue Ridge Mountains. And it was just the two of us. And it was a, a week of us driving around and playing in streams. And all of a sudden, I was like, oh, I thought I was the victim in him leaving. I thought he was a bad guy and I was the victim. And now that I'm doing this, oh, my God, was he the victim? If I didn't get to witness wow. this, that would be life ending for me. That is right. so much more significant. I did fine without a dad. I would be dead if I didn't get to watch all that. So mm -hmm. that was a weird switch and he was already Ooh. dead and i i just was like oh fuck i have great sympathy for him that he missed the whole thing and he has no he had no idea what he was missing. yes and 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 then weirdly too when he when he was dying i was flying home every week to take him to chemo and to help him and do all the stuff and accidentally i got it in my mind i wanted to take a picture because my wife was pregnant for the with our first baby. And I was like, while I'm home spending all this time, I'm going to take a picture of every place we ever lived so I can show her everywhere I lived. Wow. And, and then, so my dad was just along for the ride. I didn't anticipate this being like a, a movie. Bonding thing, yeah. Yeah. I just was like, I'm driving around. I'm going to go to this old house and this old house and this old house. And so we go to the apartments that we moved into when we moved out of the family house when I was three. These shitty fucking apartments above like an IGA and we're there and I'm taking a picture and before we leave the parking lot he goes oh man god that fucking stoplight right there I remember dropping off the couch your mom wanted the couch and I dropped it off with the truck and then I like made it through that light right there and then just had to pull over because I was crying so hard I couldn't see and I was like, I'm driving away from my life. Mm. Like, wow, that's so I'm heartbreaking. Physically driving away from. And I have to say, and until then, my story was he dropped the, co the couch off mm. and then went and got, and got laid and partied. Like, I, I didn't, yeah. it yeah. didn't even cross my mind that maybe that whole thing was heartbreaking for him as well. So, like, that was weirdly healing and helpful and then just well, don't you think too it was the understanding of alcoholism at a certain point like you know clearly you said your dad got sober when you were 14 yeah so to have this the, the shift in perception that oh it's a sickness not a character flaw 
right? I'd love to say that I did, but I didn't. I, and, and I have had zero compassion for my father. The, uh, the compassion I'd show a stranger at a meeting with ease, mm -hmm. I was never <laughs> able to show my dad. I'm like, yeah, addiction, fuck you, you had kids. <laughs> like, yeah. When I have addiction and fuck, and fuck up, it should be understood. But when he, no, I had yeah. no sympathy for right, it. Right, I right. didn't care. Got um, it. But I, I'm wondering if now this sort of shift that you're talking about has to do also with your understanding of somebody having an illness and, oh my God, he missed his life because he missed the best part of his life, which was raising you yeah. because of that. Well, I think, I think that's in the mix for sure. But I also just think he's 18 when he has his first kid. My mom's pregnant at her graduation. He goes to Vietnam for like four months, but gets out. By the time he's 23, he has two kids. Wow. Yeah. And they had been together eight years and they fucking loved each other. It wasn't, they, they remained best friends. So that was another wow. huge blessing. It's not like he was estranged. He was welcome to be at the house on Christmas. They, they stayed really close. They were soulmates. They were just too fucking young and they grew in right. different directions. And my mom was ambitious and didn't want to be a housewife. So a lot of stuff was in the mix. And I think a lot of it was just like, he also was like, mm, fuck this. I, I want to be a, my own human being. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I right. don't know. I can more, I guess I can more relate to that. The young part of it. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we all have different versions of addiction. Mine was pretty high functioning, right? Like I still went to UCLA and I still got through the groundlings and I was still responsible. And I had a relapse in 2020. I still was like, I never dropped the ball on the kids part. So yeah, I'm still, I'm still judgmental. I don't, but <laughs> the overall story has changed dramatically and he's not the bad guy. Right. And my mom's right. not a saint and they're both were human beings and life is fucking a beat down and it's hard. And, and, and you guys right. had kids. Yeah. If I had tried to do what we're doing right now at 22, yeah. Yeah. forget it yeah. like the amount of patience required that i didn't have so i just more and more and more i just miss him terribly like it's right. I, i'm sad that i have found all of the forgiveness too, too late i have the same experience in that my parents died both of them died when i was young in my 20s and i had i missed my father who terrified me most of my life i was scared of my dad and just the, the, the longer I'm alive and more I raise ours, you know, I'm, I'm, I miss him. And, yeah. and I feel so much compassion for my mother who was sick most of my life. And, you know, all the things I hated. And I remember going to their gravesites and reading a men's letters and, you know, because I couldn't, you know, I had to kind of, I had to forgive them. I had to, I had to yeah. make that step. And compassion is really kind of what, what, replaced it why did he die so young what did he die of my father was killed on a um my father was a director and he was killed doing shooting second unit no he, did, he was a big tv uh movie he did um wait this he isn't the helicopter the famous yeah. helicopter yeah. act yeah famous that's act. your not the, yeah. not the not the not the Chris. really super famous one which was twilight zone guy yeah but it was the one after that also on the cover of the la times where he was on shooting second location, got out of the helicopter too fast. Walked into the because he was angry, had some oh. anger issues, he couldn't and get walked the, shot. the wrong direction. Yeah. Oh. So um, it was oh. yeah, it was really really horrific. It also and, triggered the um, uh, the the. Sorry. I said it also be, was responsible for what now is standard procedure in helicopters, where doors yeah, don't yeah. open till the tail blades stop spinning. Oh. Right. We changed he the safety regulation yeah. and he, yeah. but you know, the truth of the matter is my dad didn't get his shot. He was an angry dude, jumped out of the helicopter, went back yeah. to get his script. I mean, it was some like, it was yeah. definitely connected to. He kind of died from his issues. ism. Yeah, yeah. A little bit. Yeah. So. Um, and why did mom die so young? Mom died so young. My mother was sick most of my life, sort of with, um. Uh, mental illness and wow. also with heart disease was diagnosed in her 30s and eventually um, 
it says that she had a heart attack at 47 and died. You know, there's some speculation on my point, my part as to out what actually went down, but yeah. that's, that's what mm-hmm. the family says. Yes. Do you have, did you have a kind of outsized fear of death as a result? Oh my of that? God, I still do. Are you kidding? No, You're talking no. to the hypochondriac of the ask her. I get yeah. like a headache. I get a brain tumor. Yeah, I you know, mean, I'm like, oh her yeah. Thing is now it's really it's a me. wild thing when you lose your parents young and you don't have like older people. Like, what right. does happen when you're over fifty three? Like, yeah, what what does that look like? She'll say to me, "My knee hurts," and I will literally go, "It's cancer." I, I just, I just go, I go knee right cancer. Yeah, with yeah. nothing in between. Knee AIDS. Yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's cancer, and then, and then the conversation's over. Yeah, let's run, let's go straight to the catastrophe. Yeah, yeah, let's just, start there. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent ramping up. But what's good about it is I'm very vigilant. I go to the doctor all the time. I'd rather go and have them go. Oh, that's ridiculous. You have nothing. But I'd rather hear that. Have you had the Pernuvo scan? No, terrified to do that. Don't really. I want to hear, did you do it? I just did it. And? And look, I'm a dude, I'm the most textbook dude. I don't want to go to the doctor. I went over the handlebars at the racetrack on my motorcycle and I'm like, yeah, I broke my clavicle. Whatever, this happens. There's nothing they can do about it. Two days later, my wife insists I go and it's it's in four pieces floating, right? Uh. So that's like my standard me. <laughs> but this, I was like, we got to go find out. We got to make, you know, if something can be done, I would like to know. And primarily because of my kids. But I went and y- you must go. First of all, it's a very pleasant experience. You're in there for an hour and a half. They have Netflix playing. You wear these mirror <laughs> glasses. I watched a tennis <gasps> show I would have never watched. It was great. And I got my scan. I even want to show you guys. Everything's good. Headlines, no tumors. Brain looks great. Lungs are great, which is a relief because I had been a heavy smoker. Scoliosis, no idea. My spine goes like this. Wow. Like wham. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So as a kid, every picture of me as a kid, I'm a little tilted. And my mother <laughs> shamed me. She'd be like, you're pos- you got to correct your posture. Look out your shoulders. <laughs> and I would like constantly be like, oh shit, I got I remember this. <laughs> now I oh no, it just oh, it's just it bangs are right up at the top. <laughs> oh man. So they found nothing. Well, that's super, that's amazing. See, they're I'm gonna terrified. they find stuff, but it's it was all moderate and minimal. Right. Like my prostate's a little big, my liver is a little big. Not nothing again, no tumors, right, right, no right. heart issues. And so ultimately, it's a huge relief. Yeah. Oh, you I know what? Maybe it. we should do it, honey. We do the 360 uh, heart yeah. thing. Have you done that? The CT scan yeah. of your heart? Yeah. Well, they'll tell you the calcium in your heart? Yeah. Yes. yes. We've that done that. And Kurt had, well, yeah, Kurt had I had a very... How did your... We, uh, I had no, completely asymptomatic. I went to my regular doctor, had a little funky little thing on an EKG that could have just been an, an EKG error. And right. she's like, oh, go to a cardiologist and, you know. So I went to a cardiologist who is now, you know, like my best friend. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, um, and we get, I get the scan thing and we're sitting in his office and he comes in. He's like sweating. He's like nervous. He's like, uh, you, you guys, why don't you guys go grab lunch? I got to handle this, right? So we, uh, and I just want to say, the story gets a little bit more dramatic every time yeah, I tell of course. it. He came in with a defibrillator. Yeah, yeah he, came, <laughs> he came in and he was, he was panting and people were holding him up. So we're, we're having lunch at, uh, at Brighton Cafe and we're like, wow, I wonder what happened. He looked upset. And like literally, and we're like, yeah, whatever. And we come back in and, and he was double checking the information because what he was worried about was me. Yeah. And I had an artery that was 90% clogged. And uh, with, but completely asymptomatic. Yeah, and it's all genetic. He probably he said it probably started happening when you were a teenager. Wow. And uh, and then two days later they put a stent. Yeah. yeah, they just. And what does it that? Open. You go from ninety percent closure to what does this stint get you? Are you at like sixty or fifty? Uh, uh, yeah, um, probably uh, into the seventy percent. Okay, it does quite a bit. And did you notice anything? No, that Nothing. was a wild thing. And you know, we do holistic. We have a lot of. We're big believers in Western and holistic medicine. Uh-huh. You know, and I had a holistic doctor that explained that. Well, if it happened that early, 
your body made the adjustment. Uh-huh. That's why it was asymptomatic. Not that nothing was ever going to happen, right? You know, yeah. under duress or whatever. But that's why there wasn't um, symptoms, nor was there a big like shift, shift. In, in in body, you know, uh, regimen or anything afterwards. You right. Know? But terrifying nonetheless. You know. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I've That's been shocked idea. with my results because I did the <laughs> calcium thing and I'm like, I eat a hundred pounds of red meat a week. I mean, I eat so much. I know you guys are vegan. I don't want to offend anyone. I'm prepared for the worst when I go in there. Zero <laughs> percent calcium. That's fantastic. I was doing so jumping much of it, jacks. So much of it is genetic. Well, so also, my dad had heart disease and I go, my vanity has saved my life. In Always. so many ways. We I quit, say that all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I quit smoking, not because of lung cancer, although I was certain I would get it. I quit it because I, I was like, I'm going to be so wrinkly. I won't be able to act past 30. That's why I quit. Um, I've been working out really consistently since I was 24 because mm-hmm. uh, I'm vain. Yeah. And I'm like, that heart, that's my only explanation yeah. for no calcium in my heart. Yep. It's got to be exercise. 100%. Yeah. We say yeah. that all the time. Kurt yeah. and I both come from like fat kids. Yep. You know, uh-huh. and if you're a fat kid, Forget it, man. Yeah. You just, you, you know, you are constantly a fat kid in your head. Yeah. And so you're always, I mean, both of us, vigilant about that shit. What's your take on Ozempic? This is a fun topic. And I'm completely like cool with it. I'm very pro it. And yeah. I'm a little put off by people who are outraged by it. Yeah, <laughs> Me too. Have yeah. you done it? Are you doing it? Are you no, on no, it? No, no, no. That's not like a... It's one of the few ones I've 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 somehow um, you know avoided. I I I don't really have much of a, a foodism. Well, I'll tell you, I I come from morbid obesity, like uh-huh. four four hundred pounds when I was nineteen years old. You were yeah four hundred. Yeah, I mean I I I was hungry yeah, and yeah, yeah. Uh, um, and <laughs> what you might say insatiable. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, but you know, so I have that compulsivity. I eat healthy all day long and there the compulsivity always kicked in. And what it's done is it's reduced the compulsivity in a way that, you know, yes, prayer and meditation, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But 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 it's so much of it with, you know, physical, emotional, and spiritual, that is the physical component yeah. that's allowed me to now shift my physical um when I eat, how I eat, yeah. it was just the thing that went okay. Yeah, the the nagging voice went from the eleven to we two. We should be an infomercial, you guys. We should well, definitely. My childhood best friend, who I'm still best friends with, we've been best friends since we were eleven. Same childhood. He and I, God, did we go hard together? And then I stopped drinking in 2004, and he kept going. And um, God bless him. I don't know how he made it as long as he did. But it, there came a point, I guess, four and a half years ago now. And I had never urged him. I just know him too well. I right. never said, like, you should give this a shot. Right. But he kind of w- went off the res for five days, couldn't get a hold of him. When he finally called me, he's like, oh, I had a terrible flu. And I go, <laughs> yeah. dude, who, who are you talking to? I go, I, I love you you're going to die really soon. Mm. Um, would you be willing to go in to Antigua? I'll make it nice. Like you want to go down to the islands mm. and try treatment. And he was like, yeah, I do. Which yeah. blew my mind. I did not think that, I mean, cause if you've made it to, at the, I guess he had made it to 42. I don't know. Um, but he went and he's been sober for four and a half years. And it's been the greatest four and a half years because we're like fully back in business, but now sober together. It's so fun. But you can imagine the state of his body (laughs) after 42 (laughs) years. So he was 319, missing four of his front teeth, legally blind, deviated septic so bad he couldn't breathe. So we've been on this rebuild. He's got posts. He's got his teeth back. He got a deviated septum surgery. He's got LASIK. We've done it. It's like frame off restoration. He's an enti- <laughs> he's he's aged backwards like fifteen years, uh, and and then Majorno. He went on Majorno, and he just is like hovering at two twenty now, and yeah. it's kind of effortless. Yeah. And he plays fucking pickleball yeah. uh, five days a week, and I'm like, that is incredible. Who would not want that for somebody? Right, right, right. Absolutely, I think that's fantastic. Yeah. 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 
And, and yeah, for him at nighttime, like, yeah. and it makes sense. That's when we want to do everything that gets us in trouble. Yeah. It's like yep. 10 o'clock. Oh. He's like yeah. hungry. Hippo do you think time. that's well, because of a fear, a fear? I always wonder this, if it's a fear of falling asleep, you know how you don't want the day to quite end, but you're exhausted, but you just got to watch that one more thing or eat that one last thing or blah, blah. I wonder if it's that. I don't know. But. I think it's a couple of things. I think it's the same reason people have sundowners, right? Where they're all Alzheimer's comes out in the evening because when you're rested, you have much better shot at keeping your thinking in the frontal lobe and the neocortex. You know, you have more energy <laughs> to do your best thinking. And as that erodes, right. I think you, you just go back into the kind of midbrain, right. uh, you know, pleasure center, the easy ah. stuff. And then additionally, but I, I totally agree with you about the sleeping because I'm such a bad sleeper and I finally got a great therapist like two years ago who's been life changing. And he's like, has it occurred to you that you're just terrified to be asleep because you can't be vigilant? Like you could get attacked while you're asleep. Right. And I'm like, yes, that's a I mean, that's if it wasn't it is bullseye. Like, I, I, I'm like, if I go shut my eyes, well, what boogeymen are popping out? You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who's entering this room without my permission once my eyes are closed? You Ooh. know, there's those people that are like, okay, time to go to bed. Let's oh, yeah. to they just my wife. Boom. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh, uh, she's the least addictive human being I've ever <laughs> met in my life. Maddeningly so. If you guys were around her. When we met, she smoked cigarettes in the evening with her roommates. We had been together about six months, and I just randomly said to her, wow, you really quit smoking effortlessly. And she goes, I didn't quit. And I go, you haven't smoked in three months. And she goes, I have it? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my God. Like, I had to <laughs> stranglehold second by second quitting smoking. I knew to the second uh, how long it had been since I quit smoking. Um, she didn't even know she quit. Uh, <laughs> now, does she, living with an alcoholic, you know, I mean, we can get it, but does she do yeah. the other room? Does she go to the other room or no? She has been when, what's interesting about her, right, is that she, A, she has no pattern of liking addicts. I'm the first one. But she met me three years sober. So I, I was false advertising in, in a way. Mm. And then I guess, yeah, it would have been 12 years in, all of a sudden, operation number three in a row. You know, I've got to come say to her, um, I'm detoxing and I'm, it's going to get fucked. It's going to get ugly. I've been doing this. <laughs> Here we are. I think she was like, oh, wow. Uh, Oh, right. Yes. Uh, now I remember. Yes, you told me you're an addict. <laughs> wow. I mean, that's underselling it. She's watched me get addicted to toothpicks, to Hall's throat lozenges, <laughs> to caffeine, to nicotine. Right. So she knows how I'm wired. But she has no baggage from me having been destructive or causing right. wreckage. Right. And it's really was cool to see how she dealt with it. Versus how I, I've seen other people deal with it, which is like, there was nothing personal for her going That's on. So I think, great. you know, so many people have been through hell with a partner. They stand by them. The person gets sober and then they're back. And then it kind of is like, well, they didn't love me enough or oh, I shouldn't have trusted. She was liberated from all that. It was just like, oh, here's that thing you had been telling me about right, for right. 12 years. So she, she probably didn't grow up around. It. She doesn't, you know, exactly. those exactly. patterns are developed way or you know the reason that i know i just kept falling in love with addicts is because i was i was the behavior was very familiar to me of that yeah. you know i knew how to fit i knew the puzzle piece so so if you don't grow up around that kind of like uh what do you call it i'm just just, just unstable <laughs> just like i don't know what's gonna happen next right yeah i better be prepared i better be the well, you don't grow also, up with that, so you don't, she, you know, you're not drawn to it necessarily. So you also right. have to be, you know, it, you, I get the sense she's also a, a, a whole person. Oh, uh, yes. You, do you know what I mean? Oh, unlike any of us. Like, exactly. Like, there is an innate sense of, you know, she has uh, self I am with, right, Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, it's yeah, so like, foreign. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't want to assume you guys would find it as crazy as I do, yeah, but no, I, I'm yeah. like, oh, wow, this is what it looks like. You yeah. have. Yeah, yeah. Self-esteem. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. And you've earned you, that. You, you wake up with that. <laughs> I want to ask a question about how that, this comes back to our podcast questions. How yeah. does that translate in, in the parenting of your children? Yeah. Like, in other words, is she, is she sort of coming with not the same baggage as you? So how does that kind of balance itself out? I know from, for me, I'm a more kind of controlling parent in that, you know, I, you know, I, I just come from a, a fearful place, you know, yeah, that's, yeah. you know, I think the worst is going to happen. So I, I, I'm more of that kind of parent, which, what, how does it work with you guys? Um, it, it is, this is not to say it was not hard the first couple of years, because we're both very alpha, like do not let her exterior fool you. She gets exactly mm -hmm. what she wants. And as she should, she's talented and uh, ambitious and skilled and decisive. So I think it's the first time either of us have both chosen an alpha partner where like there's a lot of compromise that was foreign to both of us, <laughs> which had worked itself out before kids. But then once kids come, because to be honest, at a certain point, I could be like, yeah, that's fine. I disagree, but I can go along with this. The kids all of a sudden is like, well, no, they got to turn out a certain way. And actually, I will die over this. And I'll fight. In fact, I would I might kill you. I feel so strong because they're more important than you and me. You know, it certainly is a crazy new dynamic where we had to learn to compromise all over again. Mm. With that said, I think we have a really, really uh, pretty good and easy flowing situation, which is. I'm kind of the disciplinarian. Um, I'm, I tend to, I, I, I'm not worried if they're mad at me. <laughs> I had a bad dad and I know I'm doing a great job. So like when they're mad at me, I'm like, yeah, of course you are. That's your job. And, and you'll get over it. I don't have a problem with that. She is the best nurturer on planet earth. Like I'm so grateful. They have her endlessly to walk in with any situation. I have baggage of like, I got to make you tough because this world is very hard. And I, you need to be fearless and tough. And I, that's what I have to combat is I have to keep going, no, 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 they're not living in the world right. you did. And you do not need to pass these skills on. In fact, that it is a burden to pass these on. But in general, I'm very lucky in that she really respects my kind of intuitive take on parenting. My mother was really cool. She never lied to us. She told us the truth about everything. We had a ton of freedom. I want that for my daughters and Kristen has, they ride dirt bikes and they do crazy shit and they're, uh, they can walk to Starbucks if they want at eight years old. Like, I, right. so I can't imagine that's Kristen's disposition to assume that that should be done. So right. that's a way that she's like, has trusted me a lot. And then I often defer to her when like, she does have a more generous view of humans which I aspire to and is correct. Mm. You know, I think the way I always sum up Chris and I in a single sentence is when we're walking down the street and we see a guy coming, I think he's going to try to steal my wallet and she thinks he might cure cancer. <laughs> oh, and that's, that's so literally lovely. how diametrically wow. opposed we are. And we're together is this one thing. And I've come to, be grateful for it because I think our kids have both versions to see which one yields better results or is reasonable. That's great. See, yeah, I would I would think that he had the cure to cancer, but motherfucker wouldn't give it. <laughs> okay, great. So there's a third option on the table. Uh, you won't get yours. You'll get yours. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's where I go. <laughs> what do you think about the guy coming down the street? What's he going to do, Katie? Well. I don't think he's going to necessarily steal my wallet. I I think, uh, what do I think? I don't know if I think about him that much. Oh, that's healthy. <laughs> <laughs> what guy? <laughs> what do I there think? was a guy? <laughs> I started thinking, what does he think about me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, that's that's the real truth of it. You know, it's like, oh, okay. Do I have, what's, what's so wonderfully honest. Yeah. What is he thinking? You know, but in terms of my children, I would say I'm, I, I, I probably am a little more like you in that, mm. oh, well, maybe not. I don't know. I'm a bit overprotective is what I would say in terms of, 
Well, actually, with my first one, I really was. I was yeah. so like, you don't know what the fuck's going on. So I was very overprotective. But by the second one, I was definitely looser. I would say, you know, you realize, oh, it, 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 it's all going to work out. It works out. Yeah. So um, Th- this may be non nauseating but i am have always been a pessimist i have the same thing you're talking about it's instability when's the other shoe gonna drop when's shit gonna go crazy um i have such pessimism from the second we decided to have kids she was like you should probably get your sperm uh count checked and i was like why would i get my sperm count checked and she's like well because you've fucked everyone you've met and you've never gotten anyone pregnant it seems like probably you're sterile <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, that, we have a similar go ahead yes and i was like hun i am great at the pullout method that is exactly why i've never gotten anyone pregnant and she's like no one is that good at the pullout method <laughs> so this became this whole thing and i said listen let's try first if there's something i will but i actually think this is gonna go perfect like i feel <laughs> This thing, this is the thing in my life that's yeah. going to be perfect. And I believe it. I and it's going to be wonderful. <laughs> and it's going to work right away. And we got pregnant right away. And the baby was healthy. And when they came out, I'm like, you're capable of everything. I've never had the level of optimism and confidence and belief in any part of my life. Like I have this one thing. I'm so optimistic. I'm not fearful. They're so capable. I just believe they can do it. Now, I was molested. So I there have been times where I said to Kristen, that person's not allowed here. I don't ever want them sleeping at that house. I have like spidey senses right, for that. Right. And luckily, she's never, ever questioned those. And some right. of them have been kind of close people <laughs> in our lives. I'm just like, that. they're never going to be. Right. Right. at the house yeah. overnight just yeah. that's not gonna happen so i have my things i'll be right. like probably neurotic about that that thing well um, it's like when the guy comes to pick up your kid and they're smelling like alcohol you know like or they pick up their kid yeah. i yeah. remember going through that where yeah. like they come and they're like three sheets to the wind they're gonna put their kid in the car I'm like you know what she can come visit us we're never going to their house yeah 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 right? yeah yes yes yeah there's weird things too. I've interviewed a lot of different survivors over the last six and a half years. And I've learned these weird things they do. Shit that I didn't even really notice in my childhood. But like one of the weird clues is like taking tons of pictures of kids. Mm. Oh. Like the Nasser case. I had interviewed, sadly, one of the gymnasts who had been a part of that. And one of his things was he was constantly photographing the kids. Wow. And I'm like, yeah, that is weird. I have no desire to take a picture. I don't even, I can barely take pictures of my own kids. My mm-hmm. wife's like, you got to take pictures when you're, and I'm like, oh, okay. I'm never taking pictures of other people's kids. <laughs> well, why yeah. would I? Yeah. So it's this weird little yeah. thing. And probably the people are totally innocent. But if I just, I'll just clock weird things like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. wait, you are, a, you, you are a youth coach in six different youth leagues at 64. And you're renting a house, you're renting a room in your house to a woman with a seven-year-old. I hate being around kids unless they're mine. Right. What kind of dude want, like, what is yeah. happening here? I just, yeah. you know, I'm just on high alert for this shit. Yeah. That's a good spidey sense. I, I think, uh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's good. It's pretty Listen career to- altering. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Life altering. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to know if there's anything about your uh, childhood well, it sounds to me like there might be some stuff you would change, but um, if you could, if you could, what what would that be? Would it that have been, you know, mom and dad never get a divorce? Do you ever think about that? Do you even like wonder, like, gee, would this have been what 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 about your childhood would you change? Um, I don't know if this sounds disingenuous, but like, not not one thing. Like, I lo- I love. I love my life so, I cannot believe my life uh, daily. I'd say my biggest challenge in life is accepting my life oh, and not assuming someone's going to knock on the door and go like, big mistake, <laughs> you're a piece of shit. You yeah. don't get these three beautiful girls in your life. You don't get to live in this house. I love my life so much. I love my skill set. 
my job has evolved to now I'm just interview people. And that's what I do three days a week for the last six years. And the gift of that background is so invaluable now mm -hmm. with the job I have, which is like, if I sit down with somebody, I can tell within 12 seconds if they've had the crazy childhood. I can, I can tell how people look around the room. Right to make sure they've got it. Okay, they're in here and I can get out that way. Like I can just right, feel right, that. Right. And and I love those people. I immediately truly love those people. Um, MGK, Machine Gun Kelly. I don't follow his music. At first glance, I'm like, this guy maybe is a lot. He sits down and I just watch him. Then I'm like, oh my God, I love this boy. I love him so much. Like I see the battle armor and I see yeah. that you're afraid to get hurt and I can relate. And yeah. um, so the gift, the lifetime gift of being able to like connect with people and see people um, is so worth the, whatever the price of admission was. Mm. Well, and I'm sure, there, yeah, it just sounds like your childhood completely informed that, you know, kids that come from sort of mixed, unstable, blah, 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 blah. They always have to figure out what the temperature is, like what mm -hmm. the fuck's happening. And they have yes. to be able to read people, read people, not read their minds necessarily. Like okay. we still have, I mean, that's my, my false uh, narrative is that I think I know what you're thinking at all times. And uh -huh. the truth is I don't, yeah. I have to be able to say to my husband, are you thinking this? Cause I think you're thinking this. And if he says, no, I have to trust him. But no, he's not thinking that. Hold on, the comedy cup is here. Dude, that's my daily cup. Oh, that there is, you go. That is how I drink uh, coffee. I'll take one barrel of coffee, please. <laughs> we have nothing in between. Um, <laughs> I'm guilty of that too, really bad, Katie. I I, I assume well, I know be, someone's motive. Mm -hmm. And I and I am I am a high percentage batter, which can be misleading. I am right. Pretty often enough that I, I start believing I am clairvoyant <laughs> and my wife Absolutely. is great at reminding me like, you know, sure, that's an option. Also, uh, right. they could be having the worst day of their life right. or they could actually like you a ton and are intimidated by, you, you know, like, yeah. Yeah. so she's really a good countermeasure to my, I know what everyone's up to story. Well, her childhood was that she did, you know, they probably talked to her. <laughs> They probably told yeah. her what time oh, it was. You know, communication. Us, those yeah. of us that don't come from yeah. that, we're just, you know, we're on it. We're figuring it out. We just have to. Survival. And you know, when you're talking to someone that has our background, I'd say that's the other thing. I reference this probably too often, but in that same interview with Machine Gun Kelly, he is telling me that he's from Cleveland, that that's his home. But I've researched him and I know he's, he only lived in Cleveland for two years. And I have the faintest, when he says that's my home, I have the faintest, like a millionth of a smile, like just the tiniest smile that no one in the world would have seen. Right. And then I hear him, I hear the cadence of his answer now, just shift for half a second. And then he carries on. And then I go, hey, did you see me smirk just now? And he goes, yeah, what, what was that? And I go, oh, man, I'm okay, good. I'm glad I'm right about that. I go, I call my home Milford, and I only lived there for two years because that was the two years I met Aaron Weekly, and life was stable, and I fucking loved it, and that's home. And I just was like, I was just like, oh, yeah, yeah, I have that same thing. Right. And he's oh, like, wow. okay, okay, good. Yeah, I didn't know if you were laughing at me. And I'm like, oh, no, no, I wasn't, and I'm glad – well, I'm glad we cleared that up. Right, right. Let's continue. So it's not even as much even reading them as just knowing that they're reading you. Wow, yeah. Right. And you yeah. can't let things move beyond that, those weird little yeah. the, moments. Because then the trust is gone. Yes. Did you now, learn that by doing this, Doc? I mean, how did you, is it been like you didn't do that right away? Yeah. I didn't do that right away. Um, I think I've gotten better at it, but also I think I am, I'm, I'm, I'm a good communicator. Mm -hmm. Like I, again, my mom and I were inseparable. She's a great communicator. I, I, I unlike most dudes, I can sit and look a guy in the face right, and, right, and right. chat. I right. don't need to be walking side by side. Uh, 
That's uh, awesome. I've had that, but yeah, but, but but now I do have thousands of hours of sitting with right. people six feet away for two hours at a time. And it, and it has, yeah, it's, it's definitely, I've gotten better at it. We are so new to this. And right. I knew some of your backstory in terms of, of, of recovery and shit and my sense of who you are. And this leads into my next question is, is essential is I, you know, like I had a sense of how we would engage yeah. and that it would be, and, and cause you have a relationship with Kate, you yeah. know, um, which leads us to this question. Like, I know that for me, in fact, we just, we did a podcast a couple of days ago and, and, and I got it, I got hit with it in the face, which was an expectation of who I was, right? So that the other uh, guest had? Uh, the, the, that the that the podcaster had of me. Oh, okay. and so like I know I have a book out there. I have a certain lore yeah. that there's an expectation of who and what is going to walk into the room. Yeah, yeah. And then so the question is, do you feel that you have that? And when how do you make the adjustment in those circumstances or do you lean into it? Because there was a period in my life where I loved the fact that people were intimidated by me and I leaned into it I, and I don't do that anymore. Yeah. So I, I've not, I've not rewritten my book, but I've added new chapters. Yeah. How about you? Well, let's just stay on you because <laughs> <laughs> I've never met you, right? but I saw Sons of Anarchy and you're a writer. Mm-hmm. And then I find out you're heavily tattooed. And then I know you ride. And so my fascination in college was Hell's Angels. Mm. I was gonna do I was an anthropology major. I was gonna do an ethnography on the Hell's Angels oh, and wow. live with them. I've read every book about the Hell's Angels. And so, and I knew you were sober. And having never met you, here were my assumptions about you. I'm like, this guy, I have the same thing this guy has. He was scared a lot as a kid, mm -hmm. and he wanted to send a signal to the world, just pick someone else. Not even, I'm a tough guy, mm -hmm. just pick someone else, mm -hmm. it'll be easier for you. I'm going to be a handful. That's what I assumed about you. Right. I assumed you are doing and exploring the same thing that I've spent a lot of my life doing and exploring. Mm. Which, which is, is muscles, tattoos, right. masculinity. Uh, again, violent town, violent stepdads, older brother. I just want the world to know, don't fuck with me. You'll have your hands full. Mm -hmm. And what's ironic, so I just interviewed Conor McGregor like nine days ago. And I said to him, do you find that it's ironic that you have established yourself as the toughest guy in the world? And yet the result of that isn't safety. Mm -hmm. It's actually more danger. Exactly. There are more guys now that want to test themselves against you. And you've got to be more vigilant. He took it to like where you and I played. Mm -hmm. He took it to the top of the mountain. Mm -hmm. And he's not safer. He's in more danger. Right, right. And that's what my wife's taught me is like, she saw a few fights early on. And she's like, you know. This was this this truly changed my life. She had seen me get and we got in. I got into one on the street because a guy threw a thing at our windshield and blah, blah, blah. She was very disappointed, understandably so. At you for, at me. for engaging. Yeah. Right. And I said. I'm I'm confused. I would think you would know. You are so safe. Like a fucking lion could come at you. I'm going to take it on. There's, you will never. This is what I think mm -hmm. the service I'm providing to her. You're safe. I want you to feel safe. She said, honey, the notion that wherever we're at, that you could get into some situation that's totally out of control does not make me feel mm -hmm. safe. It makes me feel way more scared. Mm -hmm. And I was like. Well, that genuinely is the opposite thing I'm trying right. to do. Right. And I was like, this is <laughs> like that shattered. I was like, oh, my God, I'm that fucking backwards about this. Right. The people around me who I thought 
I had this story about myself and this delusion that they would have listed number one reasons you like Dax, he'll protect me. Mm -hmm. I thought that would have been number one. Right. And the truth is, he makes me feel unsafe. Would have, that would have been one of the first things people right. that love me would have said. Right, right. Oh my Katie, God, that she is must so, be shaking her uh, head like she I knows think, about this. And I completely relate. And, you know, it, I, I never quite know what Kurt's going to do. It's one of the things I adore about him. And you're absolutely right. There is mm -hmm. a bit of anxiety about like, okay, yeah, unpredictable. how's this going to go down? And less and less because Kurt has become much more uh, uh, embraceable. I guess that's the right word. Embraceable mm -hmm. and much mm -hmm. more present um, in the last two, three years. So that yeah. that's wonderful that she said that to you. It's so, so true. Oh, it's so the true. biggest gift anyone's really ever given me because right. I, I had it completely backwards. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, mind you, now it's in the zone she likes, which is like, I don't need to take on every power struggle. I don't, I don't think every dude is out alphaing me because that thing happened. But if shit hits the fan, she knows, she knows I'm down to party. Exactly. It's like right, in right, the right, zone. Right. It's in the zone that it should have always been in. Right, right, oh, right. You totally. Were, yeah. I rely on Kurt for the bottom line truth of it. Like, I, I know I can come to him and say, is this weird? Should I be afraid? Should I, but what, what happened? And he'll tell me and it'll be the most logical, correct answer. So I always know that that is there, but. But I think, yeah. but getting back to Kurt's question, which you did answer, but I want you to answer more. Like when you well, walk wait, into- wait, Am I right about you? Yeah, yes, those I, the I, right I would say, I would say yes. I, I would very much to your um, uh, 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 pursuit of let me be, let me lead with this because it'll create this persona or this sense of you don't have to worry I felt like I needed to lead with intimidation, yeah. right? I needed to, like, I really embraced the Machiavellian uh, uh, idea that, um, uh, you know, a little bit of fear mm -hmm. is, is, is better than being loved, right? Right, right. And, and I really, truly believe that. And, and you know, shit kind of came crashing down under that philosophy for me. About the same time things fell apart for you a little bit in yeah. the early in, end of 2019. Okay. And it forced me, I didn't lose my sobriety, but it forced me to my knees in terms of wh who am I and who, you know, wh how do I want to, how do I want to lead? What do yeah. I want to lead with? So yes. And, and now. Well, it just light life at, 400 pounds in high school is not easy, is it? No, and it's really hard to get laid. Yeah, 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 yeah. But really hard yeah. to get laid? Is that what he said? Yeah. No, it yeah. is, he, he said it's very hard to get laid. Yeah. But I don't I know what life was like for the kid that was 400 pounds in my high school. Right, right. And it was the fact that you're sitting here is almost impossible. Yeah, the, exactly. Kids destroy other human beings. Right. In the, I imagine in New Jersey, it had yeah. to be similar to Detroit, which is like, I don't know. If I were that kid, I would love to be feared. Yeah, exactly. So, and I, so, you yeah. know, when my perspective shifted, I, I still find it to be the hardest thing to do. But it's like when I see the dude with the jacked up truck and the balls hanging off the back of the truck, he is the hardest guy for me to love. Right. The hardest. Uh, which is very sad because it's the person who definitely needs the most love. This dude, right, right. no one joined the Hells Angels because they had a really safe household. Yeah, Every person that joins the Hells Angels was dominated by another man and does not want to be dominated ever again. And I have to remember that when I'm dealing with other dudes like me like mm -hmm. oh i know we're about to fight at this stoplight but really someone scared the fuck out of you as a kid and me too and i will never let anyone do that to me again you won't either 
And this is about the saddest interaction that can happen. Right. That's what's really happening is we are both had our undue f- share of being victims. Right. That's that's all this shit means. Yep. It's yeah. like the, right. I can tell well, you, people that say very few guys yeah, yeah, yeah. that have all this shit because yeah. they're super well, healthy. Yeah, it's like it's like <laughs> what do these mean? And for me, it's just it and and it's a pat answer, but it's the absolute truth, which is it's a desperate cry for attention. That's all it is. <laughs> right, right, you know? right, right, um, right, right. I and it's, it's just, it just reminds me, and this was one of the things that was uh, that it was a little tip to my bottom. In most recently, which yeah. is, I was on my bike. We were, I was heading to the country mart for brunch with my family. Yeah. There's some dude in a, 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 a vintage fucking Mercedes convertible, cut me off, had words, blah, blah, blah. I start chasing him, right? I'm revving up. I'm like fucking, you know, coming up on the side of the car. He's flipping me off. He's trying to run me off the road. I'm like, go pull yeah, yeah, of course. He pulls over, right? I pull over get off my fucking bike. <laughs> I stand up, he opens his door and we're both like, you know, I was like late fifties. He's like 65. Uh, he gets uh, out of the car uh, and we're uh, like, uh, 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 <laughs> exactly. It was like, what the fuck are we going to do right now, dude? Uh, and we both, we both just looked at each other and went, <laughs> and literally I just went, you good? He's like, <laughs> Yeah, I'm oh okay. All right. Yeah. We get back, I get back yeah. on the bike. You're he gets in the car. Like, oh my God. Yeah. I'm still here. It's like, and I'm like, what, what's going to, what am I, what am I going to yes. do? Slap you? What the yes. fuck is going to happen? And, yes. and I just remember he, he left. I sat there on the side of the road on my bike, just going, who, what it, who, who, what, it, what's happening right now? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. just one of those, like, what did I think was going to, like, is that, that can't be. Well, when you, yeah. when you read about PTSD and you read if you've read The Body Keeps, Keeps the Score, it's a great fucking book. And the reason the guy wrote it was he was working in a VA hospital as a young psychologist. And he would see these veterans come in and they would have kind of a pretty small tiff with the administrator or the clerk. And they would just lose it. They would lose it. It was life or death. Mm. Mm. And I was reading that and I was like, I really relate to that. I one time got in a fight with a guy trying to mug me in Santa Monica, a member of the Santa Monica Tracy. This was in 2000 when I was in college. And I have this story. And for a long time, I loved this story because he tried, he wanted money. I didn't have that. Then he told me to give me cigarettes. Then he pulled up his shirt like he had a gun. Then crazy fight ensues then as the gang tries to break my door down the cops come blah 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 it's a great story i love it i've told that story now and people are like smart friends of mine are like you think that's a great story like you would have died over a pack of cigarettes that's a good story and i really had to think that through because on the surface they're totally right but if you've had an experience in your life where I give you these cigarettes. You now know I will give you whatever you want. Mm -hmm. What do you ask for next? Mm -hmm. And for me, I've had the experience where next was getting molested. Mm -hmm. So for me, to give anyone an inch is the first step on the way to a place I'll never go again in my life. It's illogical, but it's the truth for me. I know what comes next once you have me over a barrel. Mm -hmm. And so I will die for the first thing because the first thing's just in road to the thing that I would die for. So it's so stupid on the surface and it is, but for me, it means a lot more. And the thing I'm trying desperately and and I have made a lot of progress in is like, I'm not a kid anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm a full grown guy. I'm big. I have money. I'm not in danger anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. It takes a very long time to believe you're not in danger anymore. And you have to actively tell yourself and remind yourself because you're not just going to magically feel that you are not in danger. You you really have to prove, I have to prove to myself regularly, I'm not in danger. This person can be around me and that's fine. I can handle this. And I'm not a kid. Don't you also... Don't you also think that that is where some sort of spiritual connection comes in? Because 
if I can't believe that I'm not in danger, I have to then rely on the fact that something is watching out for me so that I cannot just rely on my own my own belief system. In other words, my belief system has to change. You know, it's that whole situation of like, well, that same whatever that was that helped me to not get loaded from one day to the next is also that same sort of thing that that that's going to keep me safe, that's going to keep yeah. me from having to respond in a way that is my child way. I don't have mm. to respond that way anymore. You know? Yeah. yeah. I think that that kind of comes into play as well. I totally. It's hard totally, though. Yeah. It is very hard. It's embarrassingly it's practice, hard. Babe. That's why they say it's practice. You yeah. know, we're not, we are here just to keep practice. We're not here just to get it. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think that, that that's, you know, that's the whole journey. That's the whole deal. But it would be such a shame and a waste that you or I, would miss the fact that we created a world for ourselves where we are safe. It would be such a dishonor to the insane gifts I've been given exactly. to continue to live like I am powerless. Totally. So I don't want to do that. And obviously, kids dramatically help your motivation to mm -hmm. not do that. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's always my trip about recovery, too. I, I mean, not to keep bringing it back there, but you know, I always think, I think that recovery, I like, I don't like when people say, well, I just act that way because I'm alcoholic. I just, that's just the way I am. Yeah. yeah. I like the concept that we get better. I, I like the concept that, yeah, we're never cured. I mean, I, I, I definitely can never look like I, I can't go where there's blow and a bunch of alcohol. <laughs> you know, I, I can walk in, but I'm not going to hang, yeah, yeah. you know, but I do like the concept that, that this thing that, I, that we get better, that we grow, that we change, that we, you know, well, why else do it? Yeah. Better. You <laughs> yeah, know, we yeah. get faster to like, oh, I don't need to do that anymore. I don't need to think that, you know, I yeah. just know a lot of people um, and maybe that's the best they can do. You know, that's OK, too. But that's a grievance I have, too, in the program. I have many, as most people in the program do. But yeah, this notion that we're different. I don't think we're that different. I think the human condition <laughs> I think the human condition is a beat down. And I think we're lucky enough to have been brought together for this one reason that right. then we try to explain everything with. But I just think like, no, every human, str you know, we're not uniquely struggling. Right, right. right. The terminal uniqueness, like we're not, I'm not having a harder time than someone else. Mm -hmm. I'm having a specific time of a kind of hard time. But my wife has depression. I don't have that. That's harder. There's no meeting that fixes your depression. Right. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. Yeah. No, I always qualify that when I, like, I always speak to, and, you know, most of that's my humanity. And then some of it is, it crosses the line into my compulsive, obsessive is. Right. You know, but there, you know, it, it, it's, it is my, at its core, it, 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 most of it is my humanity. Yeah. You know? I want status. Yeah. And I want to be beloved by everyone. Right. But that's because I'm a human exactly. social primate, not because right. I'm an addict. Right, right. Well, and you're also an actor. <laughs> <laughs> Should we eat some pie? You, you wanted to know why I like this pie the most? Yes. Because if I had to pick, I'm definitely uh, savory over sweet. Mm. I'd rather eat a bucket of French fries than ice cream. Mm-hmm. So the pecan pie is doing all things at once. There's 10 sticks of butter per pie. It's a salty, buttery pie. It's virtually French fries. <laughs> so did you, um, oh, of course, we want to get to your I'm history. Bad, right? Did you have pecan pie in Detroit? Was that something that you uh, discovered later in life or? Later in life, when I was welcomed into the good life. These are pricey, these pecan pies. No shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. This is probably a $45 pie. Maybe more. Wow, hey, really hey, how much was this pie? He was 45 You can take it home if you want. No, I'm on a motorcycle. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. That could be disastrous. But, um, yeah, I mean, this is a price. You can taste oh, good. the price. You can, you can also taste the butter. Yeah. <laughs> it's virtually deep fried on top, too. The pecans get crispy. Like that is a fried. good, that is a good. How so why no pie? sugar? Why no sugar? Vanity. 
<laughs> this one, no. No. Shockingly. Um, this is so sexy. I'm, I'm afraid you'll get too aroused when I tell you this. But I have psoriatic arthritis. <laughs> oh. Which is an autoimmune disease. And I control it with my diet. So I, there's a bunch of shit I don't eat. Um, gluten being one of them. Um, garlic I can't have. There's a bunch of stuff I can't have. And sugar is low on it, but sugar is not good. If I eat a bunch of sugar, my skin starts flaking off and my joints start hurting. Wow. So I just don't eat it. And, That's a reason. and I can't moderate it. So it's just easiest for me to just not eat it than to try to eat it on Saturdays or... And you can control it strictly through diet? Yes. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I have medicine. I've been on medicine at different periods. But once I really got the diet part dialed, I don't have to have any medicine. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. That's great. What's y'all's favorite pie? Uh, You know what? No one's asked us that. Really? No, nobody has said that to us. <laughs> what's my favorite pie? That seems crazy. I you know, say, right? what's your favorite pie? And then, <laughs> okay. Um, I'm gonna say I'm. What if you said I fucking hate pie? That would be the best answer (laughs) imaginable. (laughs) Well, listen. The only time I ever had pie as a kid was on Thanksgiving when I'd go to my grandparents' house. Um, my the dessert in my house was Nestle Toll House cookies that my mom would bake once every couple weeks. Um, you got you were allowed to have three. Um, (laughs) really? Yep, it was exactly three. No one ever had two or four. And occasionally they'd end up in your lunch and uh, then there'd be a, 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 a famine. There would be no cookies for a couple of weeks and then they would come back. And I think that's the only dessert we really had was wow. those cookies. And they're oh, so cool. good. Yeah. No, I love Toll House. Oh, yeah. Her sister used to make them and she would make them. She'd add a little bit of extra flour so they would have like a like a denseness to them. Mm. So. Another move is too much butter. Oh, and then there's and they get kind of flatter mm. and more deep fry and crispy. Or savory. Yeah, you like those? Nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah, a little saltier. <laughs> That's right. They are a little bit salty. You guys don't have a favorite pie. Do you, can you even say one you I, like? I, well, I like I think, cherry pie. I yeah, would say I think if I cherry have, pie. I think I have, I yeah, like Big Benny's cherry pie. Yes. It would either be. But I don't have a, an exact, like, uh, yeah. I don't know why, because, uh, you know, when I was a kid and I was a fat kid, I just like took speed and didn't eat after a while. So right. <laughs> that was it. So I don't uh, have a childhood pie, but I, grown up cherry pie. Yeah. Cherry pie. How about yeah, you, mince, Kurt? Mince, mince meat, which is hard to find, you know. Was that a bunch of organs and shit? What's no, mince it's, meat uh, the, there's a sweet, it's, it's basically apples, raisins, oh. ginger, spices, and and my grand autumnal pie. Yeah, like my uh. grandmother used to make it, and it was incredibly savory. Like I don't, mm. I'm a more savory. Like I also can't do sweet and savory together. Mm. Like I can't, like Snickers bars. I don't understand. Oh really? Yeah. No. Um, like I can do peanuts. So this must I can be fucking with you because this is salty no, and sweet. Yeah, but see, this is when it's something like this, or even like peanut. But like, there's some, there's some things where it's, it's you know. The it works aspect. together. Yeah, they're, yeah, not, yeah. they're not like there's a se- harmony. There's not a separate experience, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Um, Second to this, I would say blueberry when it's warm. Mm. Oh, that sounds good with ice cream. Oh, you don't need ice. cream? You like ice cream? Well, I love it, of course. Yeah, but I don't really. I don't get down with it. What? Uh, 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 so tell us what do you? What do you? What do you? What's What's happening? What do you want to talk about? What, what's ha- What do you? casting career wise yeah like is there anything you want to i mean your oh i know podcast is world famous so you you know i have a podcast armchair expert mondays thursdays fridays if you're interested right and then most exciting for all of us probably and this is going to be a dude test for you Uh uh-oh i have an na beer with aaron weekly my friend who's four and a half years sober uh non-alcoholic beer called ted seegers the only logger I trust when I'm alone with my sister-in-law. What? Wait a bit. Say Ted that again. Seeger, <laughs> the only logger I trust when, when I'm, I'm alone with... with my sister-in-law. Could mean anything. Maybe you're afraid you would get in a fight <laughs> with her. Maybe you would kiss. I don't know. I don't know. 
It is, <laughs> uh, you know, it would, you know. When I'd, you're done wrapping cars around trees, Ted Seegers has a beer for you. <laughs> you would love it. I'm having so much fun just writing all the copy and the ads and everything. Oh, that's very funny. So how's it taste? Taste good? Taste, how do you, what do you think? It sincerely, it's the best one by leaps and bounds. I'd say my favorite one prior to us making this one was the Heineken Zero Zero. That's the one I like. They all taste funky to me. Mm. This tastes like a garage beer. Like you're sneaking out to the garage to have three real quick before you come in and have the one that you're acting like you're having. <laughs> it's got that nostalgia to it. Like right. you want to drink a bunch of them. Right. Some of the other ones, it's like it tastes like a slice of pumpkin pie or something. Right, like, yeah, right, this right. is fine. I would right. never want to drink more than one of these a week. Um, but, yeah, it's fun. Are you guys, uh, I know it's a, it's a polarizing topic in the program, any beers. Are you anti I was or never, pro? I was never a, a beer drinker. You so were. Me neither. It wasn't, so it wasn't, it was never a poll. Yeah. Um, I have, uh, you know, I have, a, a, I have friends 30, 40 years that will drink it when they go out. I have other people who think it's a slip yeah, you know yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. just one of yeah. those things i had uh, a friend say to me one time i was drinking one and he said you know what they say if you're near beer you're near beer <laughs> and i go you know how i know this isn't beer after three of them i don't find an eight ball <laughs> and i have never in my life drank in three beers and not found an eight ball so that's my measure of whether this thing is a beer or not <laughs> yeah. absolutely yeah, no, that's, that's very funny. That's absolutely. That's my biggest fear of taking a drink is that the next problem oh. is the Katie, it's why I have not, like, I relapsed on opiates. I didn't drink during that. Even though I had to reset my sobriety date and all that, I didn't drink. And I didn't drink not because I'm that afraid of drinking. I know. Uh -huh. I finally linked that 20 relapses ago, you know, in, mm -hmm. before 2004. I had to go, you will never have a drink and not get coke. Mm. That Those days are over. Mm -hmm. You will never have a drink and not. So it's like my alcoholism, look, the relationship with alcohol was terrible, but maybe tenable. But the relationship with cocaine was absolutely untenable. And they're just the same thing. Mm. So it's like when I think of having a drink, I think of day three on coke trying to go to bed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, when I first got to the rooms, I... I could not actually relate to the word alcohol because blow had been so much and speed had been so much a part of my story. It was only yeah. when I understood that is a, the alcoholism has nothing to do with whatever substance. It's really right. about, you know, whatever makes me not feel or feel better. I just yeah. don't want to feel anything or I want to feel great and I want to keep feeling great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, let's yeah. go. Yeah. Well, that was my then pattern. I understood. Then I could say alcoholic. Yeah, because I would get drunk to get Coke. But as soon as I got Coke, whereas most smart people continued to drink so that it didn't get right. too edgy, the second the eight ball was there, I would just drink water. Yeah. Wow. Like, all I want is Coke at this point. We don't need to dilute this yeah, at all. Yeah, let's, why, why slow down? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see. Let's get that heart palpitation. Yeah. So we but, can... Dax, I just want to say, I think you're so wonderful. And I'm not I saying that. I think you're that. so wonderful. I really do. I think that, you know, just like Kurt and I would say, like, you should be our friend. You know, we, I just think you're great. I'd love to meet Kristen. We I'd would love, love that. To, I don't know. We don't really hang out with anybody or go out to dinner, but you, we'd make exceptions. <laughs> <laughs> we're, the, we're, we're the same. Yeah. We're the same. I think people have some idea of our life and I'm like, our life, our life exists within the confines of our house. <laughs> End of story. Absolutely. <laughs> like this trip to your house is a big event for me. <laughs> right. Yeah. So maybe we'll venture out. Maybe yes. we'll all take the risk of having like a, I'll meet you for dinner kind of thing. But in all sincerity, I met you through Kevin and I was like, oh my God, I fucking love this woman to death. Immediately. Yeah, I felt yeah. the same. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, so Thank good. Her. So glad we met now before we're fighting on the roadways where before now we're evolved. Cutting, before yeah. we're cutting yeah. each we other off. be kind to each other and make each other feel safe and not threaten each other. <laughs> As I'm down to three knuckles that work, uh, I know the story very well. <laughs> I just I shared a meeting yesterday or the day before, like that I realized it's I can't remember the last time I punched a wall. Mm, yeah, that's oh, really good, wow. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know that. I don't hit people. Yeah. I, I 
a no Kurt's a puncher, a wall puncher. I like yeah. Yeah. you know, and you and sometimes it's concrete. Sometimes it's not even smart. And sometimes you get a, a, a stud behind that. <laughs> yeah. A bit of drywall you're expecting. Yeah, yeah. To. <laughs> yeah. That's another one of those pulling over and going, you good? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, dude, this is all of you. Thank you. And I know, uh, you know, I know you, you. Usually, you usually don't do a lot of this, and we so appreciate you. Oh, I was time. delighted. I knew I would like you, and I already liked you, so it was easy. Ruby. So all good. Right. You. Thanks Thank for you, the Dad. part. See, this is why I don't touch it. You like, you just flirted with yours, uh, yeah. and I butt fucked mine. <laughs> <laughs> I wait till everybody leaves. <laughs> you take off your clothes and finish the rest of it. I hope you liked that. Thank you so much for listening. Please follow, rate, and review wherever you listen to your podcast. And uh, if you like to watch, please check us out on YouTube. Apparently, I have a YouTube channel, and I've had it for um, 46 years now. <laughs> um, but no, uh, well, you can watch what we're doing here in our beautiful red room on YouTube. So thank you. Thank you. We hope you'll come back. Please come back. Mm -hmm.